Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Popham Colony was abandoned in 1608. The colonists were disheartened by the harshness of the climate and returned in the springtime to England. The exact site of the Popham Colony was lost until 1888 when a plan for the site was found in the General Archives in Spain. This plan exactly matches the location at Sabino Head near Maine's Popham Beach State Park. Later archaeology in 1994 confirmed the location and the accuracy of the plan. The Popham Colony site is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 1620, after years of disuse, the Plymouth Company was revived and reorganized as the Plymouth Council for New England with a new charter. The New England Charter of 1620 that provided for the establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Plymouth Colony, the Province of New Hampshire, the New Haven Colony, and the Province of Maine. Eric Yanis of the Other States of America podcast concludes his telling of this incredible story. In October 1607, the Popham Colony sends the Mary and John back to England full of furs. And also on board was our primary source of what was happening in the colony up to this point in our narrative. This journal of events was rediscovered in 1875 among the papers of the Gorgias family. And everything else from this point on out is a secondary source. It's something Gorgias wrote down long after the fact in one of his many books. Or from John Smith or Strachey or some other second-hand source for which we no longer have the testimony of whatever first-hand source or primary source they had originally ingested to create their own. And in addition to the furs and the account, around half of the colonists actually returned to England at this time. Because the Popham colony was so low on food, likely having traded it away to the natives already as gifts, and perhaps some also in trades for fur. Although they had plenty of metal trinkets and objects and tools for that already prepared before they left England. Now, these first colonists to bail before winter would have learned about Sir John Popham's death first, of course. But in the various letters provided from the colonists on the ground and their own personal conversation with Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, Gorgias learned that George Popham was an ineffective leader and not a terribly healthy man. He also would have learned that Riley Gilbert was an ambitious leader, but he may have been a little too ambitious in some ways. I think most historians would agree with that assessment, more or less. But here we are in December of 1607, and Ferdinando Gorgias is very optimistic. Perhaps he intercepted one letter that was supposed to go to King James from George Popham, which claimed that the Popham colony was at most seven days journey away from a sea to the west that would lead directly to China. Of course, this would be the tall tales that were told by the Native Americans to get what they needed out of the Europeans. Let's leave England and return back to the colony. The cold winter was about to set in. No first-hand accounts, short days and long nights. The winter would prove to be slow, long, dull, and unproductive. And yet of the 45 men who stayed over winter, only two of them died. Look at the nearby French colony of Saint-Croix a couple years just before this, and colonists were killing over dead left and right. But of all the people to die at Saint-Croix, the leadership was more or less left intact. It made the colony strong enough to relocate to Port Royal the very next year. One of the two people who died at Popham was George Popham himself. Once again, I have to argue with the historians and the people who decided to label these things. At this point in the colony, Sir John Popham, the main financier originally, is gone. And then his nephew, George Popham, who is supposed to be the on-the-ground leadership, is also gone. George Popham dies February 5th, 1608. On his deathbed, he supposedly wrote the following. I die content. My name will always be associated with the first planting of the English race in the New World. Sorry, George, we couldn't even give you that. Jamestown beat you to it. And so with no power struggles to be had, Riley Gilbert assumed command of the colony. Again, the weeks and the months passed. It was a long winter, by all record. And when the weather finally started to warm up, in the early spring, there was a fire. And it was a fire that started in the storehouse, the most important building for keeping everyone alive. 
and the records attest to the fact that that building was completely ruined. However, some more recent archaeological evidence suggests that the fire might have been slightly more widespread. Any way you look at it, a severe setback. But from all accounts, Riley Gilbert was not terribly dismayed by this. Again, he had some hard-working men in his colony, and he was expecting resupply fairly soon. There was no intention of abandoning the Popham settlement till Captain Davies returned in the spring, where the news that their patron saint, Sir John Popham, surnamed the Hangman, was dead. That's right, if you weren't keeping score, news traveled very slowly at the time. And so while the colonists who had returned to England, of course, knew that Sir John Popham had died, it was only in the spring of 1608 that the actual colony found out that their main financial backer was no more. And there are many other letters on board. The two most important were both from Sir Fernando Gorges himself. The first urged the colonists to stay firm on their mission, look for a Northwest Passage, trade for furs, check out the fishing spots. Because even though Sir John Popham had died, Gorgeous was going to step in from being one of the major backers to the major backer of this colony. And if we take a step back, we realize for the entire existence of this colony, Sir Fernando Gorgeous was the director back at home. He was the investor. He was in charge of operations. So again, not to be repetitive, but maybe we should call this the Gorgeous Colony. I don't know. But the second letter he wrote, that one kind of canceled out the first. Because the second letter was to Riley Gilbert himself. And it informed Riley Gilbert that unfortunately, his brother had died. Not Bartholomew Gilbert, the one who died in 1603, searching in vain for the Roanoke colonists, but Sir John Gilbert. As such, Riley realized he was about to inherit a hefty estate. Again, in this time in England, we have many second sons. Sons of nobility, sons of the sirs, sons of the knights, who inherit next to nothing, maybe some money, and then have to go out into the world and make something of themselves, whereas the oldest son tended to get everything. Well, now, Riley Gilbert was that son. He inherited tons of property, I believe a castle, a nice chunk of change, and a title. He became titled nobility. So despite the encouraging words from Gorgeous and the resupply, Gilbert packed up the remaining colonists, and he went home. And believe it or not, thus ends the Popham colony. So now I turn to a subject that many modern historians credit the Native Americans for causing the English to abandon the Popham colony. I didn't buy that explanation as the primary reason. I said it was secondary or tertiary. At this point, looking at everything again, I would say it's definitely secondary. Let's not go all the way to tertiary. It's definitely secondary. The strongest piece of evidence that these historians have is a little bit of evidence in 1612 reported that the natives in the area have pointed out the Popham site to them and claimed that they pushed out the English. The natives were very well aware of the rivalries between the different European powers, and they were incredibly astute at manipulating Europeans into getting what they want, getting captive natives back to their homeland by promising, oh, there's gold mines, oh, China's just to the west. By the year 1612, the natives were very well aware that the French and English had a rivalry with one another. And so one of the best ways to ingratiate yourself with the French is to claim that you had a hand in pushing out the English. And just to throw out one piece of counter evidence, in the entire existence of the colony, as short-lived as it was, there were only two people who died. Both died over winter, and one was George Popham, who died of simply being old and unhealthy. Clearly, there was no mass assault on Fort St. George nor no slowly winnowing down of numbers through guerrilla attacks. Let's turn to the legacy portion of our story. A lot of these short-lived colonies, typically there is no legacy of them in uh, the written accounts or in the books or in the encyclopedia articles, in the JSTOR articles. Many people consider them too short-lived to have had any real impact. Well, I don't. So let's get into some of the legacies of Popple. Remember, they built a boat, which the people of Jamestown and the people of Plymouth, many years in the future, wouldn't be able to do for a very long time after their foundation, whereas Popham Colony did it almost immediately. It was a seaworthy vessel called the Virginia, and it was actually used by the Jamestown Colony eventually. So it changed hands and moved from the Virginia Company of Plymouth to the Virginia Company of London, and it became in service in the Jamestown Colony. But Jamestown also benefited from some of these Popham colonists. Eventually, they were relocated to Jamestown. And the third transfer was money. The investors back in England, after the failure of Popham, many of the investors in the Plymouth Company took their funds over to the London Company, thus flushing Jamestown with more investment. 
And so in the short term, Popham's failure was all to the benefit of Jamestown. And now we don't need to tell you why Jamestown is important. It's the foundation of English settlement in the South. The Popham colony becomes a corpse and that corpse feeds Jamestown. Now let's go to the medium term legacy of Popham. There are unsubstantiated rumors and they will always remain unsubstantiated that some of the Popham colonists remained in that area of Maine or that they returned to that area of Maine for different fishing and fur trading operations. And we'll see the murky beginnings of this area that we now call the state of Maine into what's now New Brunswick and even Nova Scotia and how the English will be hobnobbing around there way earlier than you would think. The medium-term consequence for the Plymouth Company, the Virginia Company of Plymouth, was just disastrous. The Popham Colony proved to be a failure and began this notion that Northern Virginia or Norumbega was too cold to be settled by the English. Sir Ferdinando Gorgias wrote after Popham, All our hopes have been frozen to death. And then the long-term legacy is that there are references to an English settlement, at least. And then in the long term, the Popham colony helped to solidify the English claim to that area of North America. One of the ways that Europeans argued that they owned a certain area of the world was occupation. I have a colony there with people, my people living there, or I did have people living there, the former being more convincing than the latter. And so it helped stake out that claim against the competing French claim. Also, there are vague references to this occupation in the charter for the Council for New England, which the Virginia Company of Plymouth will eventually become. And it is that council that provides any sort of legitimacy to the colony of Plymouth. So Popham helps to legitimize this future council. This council legitimizes Plymouth. And also this council inadvertently, accidentally, not under Sir Ferdinando Gorgias's eye, legitimizes the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the distant year of 1629. And so Popham planted the seeds of legitimacy for the colonies that we do know and love, but it also made way for those colonies because Popham was a failure. Imagine if it was a success. The history of the area that we now call New England would be completely different. We might not even call it New England. This wonderful haven for separatists and Puritans may not have existed if Popham had taken off. It might have become a merchant adventurer empire populated by financially minded fur traders, for all we know. And so in the house of cards that is history, Popham needed to fail so that we could have Plymouth and we could have Massachusetts. And in rebuke of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and so on and so forth. The butterfly effect comes in at this point. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs> 